What's going on everybody? In today's video, we're going to be checking out Taylor Swift's Speak Now album. If you guys can get this thing to like 5,000 likes, I will love you forever. Tell YouTube to recommend my stuff. Now before we get into this, one of the most important things I have to do is ask you guys to smash that subscribe button. I am on the road to 200,000 subscribers and I cannot do it without you, so please help me reach those goals by smashing subscribe down below. I also want to take a second to mention today's video sponsor, SeatGeek. SeatGeek is a really cool and easy to use app that allows you to purchase tickets for sporting events, live concerts, and other things like that. It's cool because they base everything on a 0 to 10 rating scale, where red or 0 is letting you know that it's not really a very good deal, stay away. Green is the thumbs up from SeatGeek, and that's gonna let you know that that is a good value for what you're purchasing. What's even cooler about SeatGeek is they have actually partnered up with my channel to sponsor my channel. And that means they're gonna be hooking all of you up with $20 off your first ticket purchase using SeatGeek and using the code Steven in Stereo. I honestly geeked out so hard, no pun intended, when SeatGeek was going to sponsor the channel because I've been using SeatGeek for well over a year now for all of my NBA games, any concerts I've gone to, and sometimes I browse the app just to see what's going on. So make sure to use code Steven even in stereo, check the link in the description to download the app today or visit SeatGeek.com. And again, thank you guys so much for sponsoring this channel. So the day is finally here. There's been a lot of hype around this album. I have been very busy. As you can see, my house is emptying faster and faster because I am moving across the country for the last time in a long time. And with that, there's been a lot of things coming up that have stopped me from being able to do this album again. I like to sit here and really give it my full attention. And when I have a lot of stuff going on and I feel like I can't have a clear head to really listen to the album and appreciate it, I feel like that takes away from the moment. It takes away from this piece of art. Now today we're gonna to be checking out the standard release of Speak Now before everybody gets upset. My Patreon members are actually going to get the deluxe edition tracks. It's gonna be at a little bit of a later date just because I do have so much going on with moving, but I'm gonna do those exclusively and I won't cut them. So you'll get to listen to the full versions of those. That's going to be on my Patreon. You can check the link in the description if you want to sign up over there because all that really does help this channel a lot. Okay, so with the long winded intro out of the way, let's go ahead and listen to Taylor Swift's Speak Now. The first song is called Mine. I know this song. Actually, now that I'm looking at this, she charted a lot of these songs. They were heavily played. So let's check this out. Okay, obviously a song that I remember, a wonderful way to start this album off. And it just shows that this was a era of Taylor that I was definitely interested in. It was the, you know, a lot of these songs were being played on the radio. They're very easy to remember. And there was something about her voice in these days where she had that country pop crossover sound and it works so well for her. She is arguably one of the most unique voices when it comes to that era, in my personal opinion. And again, this is a great song to show her storytelling. She put us right in the moment of this song, very descriptive with everything, even when she talks about the fight at 2.30 a.m. I like the song when I originally heard it. I like the song still now. I hope that this is going to be sort of the theme of the album, not so much the lyrical theme. I know that she's probably going to visit a few different topics, but I do like the sound of this. I love the sound of her voice in this. Okay, the next song is called Sparks Fly. I love this sound of the instrumentals here. Sounds so good. Taylor in this track, just nailing that country pop sound. Oh my God, I'm having such a moment listening to her hit some of those notes, especially during that moment. I have my lyrics pulled up here. When she says, cause I see sparks fly whenever you smile, the way she escalates her vocals there, like damn, that is so unique for her. And I know that in her newer music, it doesn't sound the same. It's a very different sound, but damn, she took this genre, ran with it so hard and made such a massive career off this sound. And there's a reason why. Yes, I think her new albums sound amazing. And what I liked about Red was that Red had like blends of sort of, I wouldn't say new Taylor, but like, newer Taylor mixed with older Taylor. So we had a little bit of a heavier sound, but there was still a little bit of country elements to it. This song so far, two songs in, full 
country moments here. And as a kid from Houston, I absolutely love this. It's what made me originally like her. So Sparks Fly, so good. Now, I'm not sure if this is the one that is completely self-written. I think it is. I think you guys told me that. I could be wrong. It could be fearless. But I love the way that she delivers lyrics in this song. I like her writing here. Just keep on keeping your eyes on me. It's just wrong enough to make it feel right. And lead me up the staircase. Won't you whisper soft and slow? I'm captivated by you, baby, like a fireworks show. Like, there's nothing basic about the lyrics there. The way that she's writing, there's a lot of words and it's not just a generic sound. It's funny because I've heard this song as well because I've heard it on the radio. I never realized just how many lyrics were really in this song, just how much depth was in the song. So again, it's fun to go back and hear these songs even if I've heard them before, to be able to sit down and hear them again with lyrics in front of me and with all intentions of putting effort towards listening to it. Okay, so up next we have another track that I have definitely heard before. The song is called Back to December. I am gonna pull the lyrics up for this one while we listen to it though because I remember the song being kind of sad, or at least having that element, and Taylor's writing really shines in songs like this, which is it's sad for me to say that, but she does really well with a broken heart when it comes to lyrics, so let's do it. Uh, this is so important right here as to why I'm glad that I'm doing this. So I've heard the song, obviously, but the only thing that ever stuck in my mind was the I go back to December all the time. It's the only part that I ever always remember, and I could tell that the song was sad, but damn, man, really listening to the lyrics, really listening to how she explains this, it's so descriptive and her writing style really shows here. There's a couple lines that I, that I really thought stood out, and if it wasn't just the line, it's the way that she delivered it. There's like, lyrics were like stacking on top of each other, and it's almost like she was spinning bars, but it just had the sound of sadness, and it had the sound of heartbreak. I liked when she was talking about this moment where they're having a conversation after not seeing each other in a long time, and she says, you've been good, busier than ever, we small talk, work in the weather, your guard is up and I know why. But the way that she puts me in that situation, and again, has nothing to do with a relationship that I was in before, but she's writing a story with her words and putting you in that moment. And I can picture myself standing there with an ex-girlfriend, and in that moment where you see each other after you know something was bad, so she's talking about the last time that I saw you, uh, you gave me roses and I left them there to die, uh, swallowing my pride, standing in front of you, saying I'm sorry for that night. I go back to December all the time. I can put myself back in that situation. You probably could too. But the way that she writes it, it makes me feel like I'm sitting here experiencing this moment with her. And it chokes you up a little bit because you're like, damn, like I can imagine that conversation. I've been in that conversation before. The fact she's able to do that on so many of the songs that we've heard, it makes me wish that I would have had the lyrics pulled up during 1989, but I didn't really know what to expect, because Reputation, a lot of the songs were a little bit like less serious, there were some, but I was able to just kind of like enjoy the music for what it was. And so when I got into 1989, I kind of thought the same thing, but after Red and having the lyrics with me the entire time, and now this, I realized that what makes Taylor Taylor is definitely the lyrics. She's got a beautiful voice, you can't deny that. It's unique and no one sounds like her. She's got a unique instrumentation of music. It's very unique style. Um, it's like this country pop crossover and then a new age stuff. We've got like hip hop, pop R&B crossover almost while still having that same Taylor sound. But yeah, man, the lyrics are really what's, what sets her apart from everybody else. So gotta, gotta do a good effort of having lyrics pulled up when it's Taylor Swift. I don't know how I could sit here and just bang my head and enjoy it because this song is so sad. And if I'm just sitting here enjoying her voice, I might not pick that up. Although she sounds heartbroken. And that's another thing that really pushes the emotion in these. So yeah, all in all, three tracks in a row, three tracks I really liked. The next song is gonna be called uh, Speak Now, which is the, obviously the same name as the album. Let's do it. Marching in on a white veil occasion, but you are a gown shaped like a pencil. <laughs> this, 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 wish it was me, don't you? Interesting that they chose to name the entire album Speak Now with this song being Speak Now because this song is a song that I've never heard and essentially Taylor is writing from a perspective of going to a wedding of a guy that she's in love with who's about to get married and she's going to be there to quote unquote speak now or forever hold your peace and you know possibly end that wedding 
And I love the storytelling here. I love her just talking about being there and talking about someone wearing a dress that's shaped like a pastry, throwing a little bit of shade there. And Taylor just talking about how as she walks down the aisle, you're standing up there at the, at the, at the top about to get married, just wishing that it was Taylor instead of this other person that you're marrying. And yeah, I think it was definitely a fun song. It was definitely not too serious. And I love the drum beat, the doom, doom, doom. But I do think that it is a bit interesting for her to name the entire album off of this. Now, having said that, Speak Now could be numerous things because in this song, if we're really going into it, Speak Now or Forever Hold Your Peace, she's speaking a lot of truth in this album already. And she may have just been like, wow, that's a great title. We should name the album after that. But for the self-titled track, it was, it was okay. It was cute. It was fun. Um, but I definitely like her other songs better so far. So the next track we're going to listen to is a song called Dear John. Uh, here is a great, great example of a wonderful song acknowledging a really bad relationship. So from what I understand, this song is about John Mayer. Maybe I'm wrong, pretty sure I'm right. And if it isn't enough to name it Dear John, the instrumentation of the song is very much like a John Mayer song with the little guitar riffs that are happening in the back. And obviously this is Taylor Swift. That is 100% on purpose. So good for you to unapologetically call somebody out they broke your heart. Now the writing in this song is definitely my favorite because she does a really great job of saying how she really feels without being petty about it. It was from the heart in a way that was almost like issuing a warning to anyone else that ever has to deal with this person. But the way that she did it was great because it wasn't like, you're a loser, you're scum, you broke my heart. But she wrote in a very real way. Don't you think 19 is too young to be being played? Your dark twisted games. You are an expert at sorry and keeping lines blurry. Never impressed by me acing your test. All the girls that you've run dry have tired lifeless eyes because you burn them out. And then I also like when she adds, do you think I was too young to be messed with? The girl in the dress wrote a song you should have known. And also when she says, um, the girl in the dress cried all the way home, letting you know that like, this isn't just coming from, you know, her being upset about this. She was very sad and very messed up by the relationship. And for her to write this song, in my opinion, it's, it's the best way to do this. It's the best way to do this. She's very honest in it. She sounds sad, but over it. Like she sounds sad, but I don't have any reason to believe that she still cared at this moment. It was more like, I can't believe you did this. I, I don't know why you did this to me. But she writes it so well, even for somebody like me who doesn't know anything about their relationship other than it did not end great. To be able to read the lyrics or listen to the song and feel like I'm in that moment is definitely the magic of Taylor's writing style. And I don't know if the two are related. I just got my lyrics pulled up. The next song is called Mean. I don't know if we're just piggybacking off that other one, but let's listen to it. The song's called Mean. So I don't know who this song is about. We'll start with Taylor's sound. Her voice, again, this is such a beautiful sound for Taylor. I love to hear that country twang in her voice over an instrumentation like this. It just brings me back to 2006 when I first heard Taylor Swift. It just brings me back to happy memories in high school and Taylor was being played everywhere and it was always exciting. I used to work in like a country, like, country barbecue place. I was a waiter at this restaurant and we would only play CMT, which at that time is the only place that you could hear Taylor Swift's music was on country music radio stations because that's how she was marketed. And I loved that there would be a constant rotation of her sound. So I hear this stuff, it just brings me right back to that moment. And that's always fun for me to have that sort of nostalgia with an album that I've never actually listened to before. Now, as far as the content of this song, I don't know who she's directing it at. It feels like it could be a blanket statement song addressing the haters in her life, or it could be about one person in general. You guys will obviously know more than I will, but my take on it is this is a blanket about people that 
have so many opinions about her. And again, speak now, she's speaking her truth. She says a couple things that I really liked in the song. I can see you years from now in a bar talking over a football game with that same big loud opinion but nobody's listening. Washed up and ranting about the same old bitter things. Drunk and grumbling on how I can't sing but all you are is mean. It just makes me feel like she's stereotyping um, what her haters are and put now this could be a this could very much be about one person. But if you look at this song with the idea of everyone that talks about her, I feel like it works perfectly well for that too. Because it's almost like she's putting together a character of what a lot of her haters are. And I thought that that line, that that set of lines in particular really defined the moment for the song. You with your switching sides and your wildfire lies and humiliation as you pointed out my flaws again, as if I don't already see them. I walk down with my head trying to block you out because I'll never impress you. I just want to feel okay again. Now, at this time, 2010, so about four years of albums she had been putting out, traveling, touring, all those things. This is about her fourth year in. And at this point, again, if I'm looking at it based on the idea that this is about just haters in general, I think it really works, especially with the lines I just said, because it sounds like it's her realizing that at the end of the day, she could be the greatest singer in the entire world with the best songwriting and the number one record ever, and people are still going to hate her. That's just how this works. That's how anything in life where you're successful works. And it seems like she's realizing those things here. And so she's just calling her haters mean because at the end of the day, the way people criticize her and the way people criticize a lot of artists is not constructive, it's often mean. If I don't like a song on this channel, you're gonna hear me tell you. I'm gonna say it as respectfully as I possibly can. Like, wow, I just really didn't like that. But I've seen people who hear a song and they trash it so hard and I just don't feel empowered by doing things like that. Some of you maybe do, maybe you got a little bit of a complex, maybe you got small PP energy, but sometimes people are aggressively mean about things and I always like to think of the idea like, one, that's not who I am, and two, she never will, but what if Taylor Swift saw this? What if she saw this and there was a song I didn't like and I couldn't just go, yeah, that's just not really my style, but I had to say something like totally off base and messed up. That would be mean. So I like that because she's basically the whole time just saying like, I'm gonna be all these things and I'm gonna be so successful, but you're just going to be mean. So that's a good way to actually write this song and write a song to your haters. So, all right, next up on the list, we have the song called The Story of Us. Damn. Uh, Q Taylor Swift's excellent songwriting. The fact that she, again, puts us right into a moment that we can relate to. I can tell why she has so many fans and so many people that love her because she writes such pure and honest songs. And what it feels like is that all of the things, even if she didn't write them but they're co-written, all of these things are moments that have happened in Taylor's life. Because of the way she describes them, I mean, Taylor Swift should just write a book at this point because she does such a great job of putting you in that moment. So this is a song, The Story of Us, about her and, an, and a relationship and how she was so excited to one day talk about the story of, of us and how great it was in our relationship. But she's watching it end and the different situations she puts us in, we can all put ourselves in those places. A simple complication, miscommunications lead to a fallout, so many things I wish you knew, so many walls up I can't break through. Talking about how miscommunications, you know, suddenly are leading to these big fights, almost make it seem like things are failing and falling apart. So maybe you always get along, you start to have your first fights and first fights lead to bigger fights. And then before you know it, a simple like, hey, how are you, could be misinterpreted or misunderstood and now you're fighting about almost everything. I'm standing alone in a crowded room and we're not speaking and I'm dying to know if it's killing you like it's killing me. Saying like, even though we're fighting, I'm over here like, yeah, we're fighting, but this sucks, I wanna fix it. Um, but then she says, I don't know what to say since the twist of fate when it all broke down and the story of us looks like a tragedy now. And then a little bit further on she says, how was I losing my mind when I saw you here, but you held your pride like you should have held me. And I think that's a big deal when she's talking about from her perspective where this relationship is failing, she doesn't want it to fail, yet instead of him coming over and fixing the situation or holding his pride when he should have held her, he should have come over and fixed that situation. And that 
is escalated and ultimately clearly defined right here. The battle's in your hands now, but I would lay my armor down if you said you'd rather love than fight. Like, hey, I don't care that we're fighting. If you just come over to me and love me, this can all be over. I'm not fighting anymore. And it's just not happening. And that's where this relationship is ending in a tragedy. But just amazing songwriting here. The only thing about it is that the instruments didn't match the sadness of the song because it was very upbeat and up-tempo. Sometimes when you hear that, you mistake what could be a happy song for a sad song or a sad song for a happy song. And in this case, I originally thought that the story of us was going to be a love song when it first started. But all it took was about, um, I used to think one day we'd tell the story of us. Within the first line, I was like, yeah, I see where we're going here. But all in all, again, genuinely impressed, and I did like that song a lot. I'm a huge nerd when it comes to lyrics. I just love the fact that I can relate to so many of these songs. Who'd have thought that 28-year-old Steven could sit back and go, wow, in 2010, I could have related to this so much, but I didn't pick it up. If I had picked this album up, I could have been relating to all these songs, especially in 2010. Not a good time for me. Okay, the next track is called Never Grow Up. Uh, I love this song. Initially, I thought she was actually talking to somebody, maybe a younger sibling. But as the song really started to come together, and I really paid attention to the lyrics, I could tell that she was essentially speaking to herself, but her younger self. And that is obviously in the end cleared up when she says, here I am in my new apartment in a big city. They just dropped me off. It's so much colder than I thought it would be. So I tuck myself in and turn my light on. I wish I had never grown up. And I love this because the way that she writes this is nailing it for like a child, if a child, if she was really singing this to somebody. She says really important things like when you're at 14 going to the movies, you know, don't make your mom drop you off around the corner. She's gonna get older too. And just talking about like re-experiencing moments that maybe could have been different or in those times you wish would have been different. I won't let nobody hurt you, won't let no one break your heart, and no one will desert you. Just try to never grow, never grow up. And it's true, if you really think about life, I oftentimes bring myself mentally back to when I was a kid, when I was in like third grade, and nothing in the world you know, could stress me out. I didn't even know what stress was. I had anxiety because I've always had anxiety, but I didn't know what real stress was. I didn't know about, you know, how many bad things could happen in life. Great things too, but there is also a lot of negative that nobody really tells you about. And Taylor does a good job of putting that into lyrics and putting that into words. And I mean, think about it sometimes, if you could really go back and write a, a song to yourself or talk to your younger self, you know, what would you go back and say? And I think Taylor did a really great job giving advice to her younger self to never grow up because here's the truth is that I wish I had never grown up. And it was perfect around this time. There was all kinds of interesting things going on in Taylor's life with the Kanye West situation with the breakup that she had, which she's already talked about on this song. So there's already hardships and things going on in her life. So when she writes this, she's like, man, if I could just tell my younger self to not force myself to grow up, maybe I wouldn't be in these situations. So I think that's really great songwriting from her. Again, I'm not surprised because it's like nothing but bangers when it comes to the lyrics on this album. A lot of people said that Speak Now was her best album, especially after I said that there's no way Red could be topped because I think Red's emotional side was just so amazing, especially with the lyrics, obviously. I mean, the sound was great too, but the lyrics above all else were just so good. But this album is the same way. She writes very honest lyrics, very raw lyrics, and it really makes you step back and go, damn, me and Taylor have a lot in common. I see her doing all these listening parties for her new album, and it's just so cool to see somebody this successful still be a human. And I don't mean a human like she is skin and bones and blood. I mean a human like, hey, you guys wanna come over to my house and listen to this album with me? Like, that is a very human thing to do. Not a lot of famous singers would invite anybody to their homes. So it's just really cool to see all that. And again, she writes lyrics we can all relate to. The next song we're gonna listen to is called Enchanted. Enchanted 
the way that she uses the word enchanted to explain this uh, magical moment for her meeting this person in this song is so cool. The fact that she's using enchanted instead of saying the normal like, oh, this is, it was so magical meeting you. No, it's enchanted to meet you. This is going to be our fairy tale romance. And I love that as she goes on talking about that, she keeps saying things like, well, I hope you're not in love with someone else. Who do you love? She says, this is me praying that this was the very first page, not where the storyline ends. My thoughts will echo your name until I see you again. These are the words I held back as I was leaving too soon. I was enchanted to meet you. It was this fantasy moment for her to meet this person and she has all these things going on in her head. She wants this whole storybook romance to happen, but she doesn't say anything. So she just spends all this time thinking about what could or should have happened or will it happen? Or again, will this be the first page or is this the end of it? But the fact that she really put me in that situation, like Taylor, why are you putting me in your love story romance? I don't know, but I'm there. And I'm like living that moment with her and I can picture her in her head having this conversation with herself, daydreaming about what could be of this relationship with this person that she just met. And I think that a lot of us that are in love or have been in love have had this moment where you meet somebody and your head has you so far as to the future of what that meeting could have meant on your life. You know, you meet somebody and now you're married in your head, even though it's like, hi, how are you? You're like way over there because some moments that we have in our life are just magical or um, enchanted because magical is too generic. We have to go enchanted. We're Taylor Swift, we go enchanted. But I think she did a really great job with the song. And I'm starting to have that moment where it used to be that I would listen to the music and I would have trouble listening to the lyrics at the same time. But right now I'm having trouble because I'm getting so caught up in the story or the lyrics of things that I'm like not able to pay attention to the instrumentation as well. I know that when she would get to This Night is Sparkling and get into that chorus, there was a lot of buildup leading to that moment and it definitely had a quote unquote enchanted sound to it. So I really like this song. I'm just, I'm genuinely impressed by her writing abilities on this album. It's crazy that we've, I love working backwards and you expect to get to like, I don't know, the first couple albums where like people are really finding their, themselves and their sounds, but she sounds as polished as ever on this and her lyrics are just as good as they've ever been and this is 2010. Even 2019, Taylor probably looks back and goes, damn, I killed it on Speak Now. Okay, the next song is called Better Than Revenge. Okay, so I definitely feel like I just got my favorite song on the album. Now, people are gonna be upset. They're gonna be like, well, why is that your favorite one? First and foremost, Haley Williams and Paramore, anyone? That's exactly what this song sounds like. And it makes sense. 2010, Paramore was huge at the time. Haley Williams was huge. And I love that Taylor not copied the sound, but had a similar sound in this song with the drums, with the delivery in the vocals, with the lyrical content. I was feeling it so much in this. Now, I'm gonna ask this question and I am not trying to start a war, try to start a debate, but is this the diss song against Katy Perry? I 100% feel that way, but I don't know for sure, so I don't wanna start that drama up, but it feels like this was the one because I'm pretty sure if I remember correctly, and this is outsider's perspective, Katy Perry and John Mayer got together and that's why John Mayer and Taylor Swift broke up or something around those lines. You guys can clarify that in the comment section. Um, I loved this song though. I loved the way that she painted the picture. It didn't even feel petty. Songs like this can feel very petty, but the fact that it was so honest and raw left out a lot of the unnecessary feelings. It was very factual. She was speaking truth without saying anybody's name, but making it very clear that everyone knew who she was talking about. She wanted that to be clear without having to say anybody's name. And I love that because you can listen to Better Than Revenge and enjoy the song for what it is without having to put yourself in the perspective of what I think is Katy Perry, John Mayer, Taylor Swift, and that triangle of negativity right there. I'm not another thing for you to roll your eyes at, honey. You might have him, but haven't you heard? You might have him, but I always get the last word. She's not a saint and she's not what you think. She's an actress. She's better known for all the things she does on the mattress. So she was going at it, but le just the least amount of specific that you can actually relate this to your life. But 
everyone knows who you're talking about. At least I think so. So I actually really enjoyed that song. I love the drums in it. The instruments were great. Again, heavy Paramore vibes here, and I love that. One thing that could have made it better would have been featuring Haley Williams, so just to have that moment because there was a lot of the sound of misery business here. So all in all, cool song. Did You know, sometimes those songs are the ones that you know, you're like, oh, that's kind of cool, but then you don't ever listen to it again. But I feel like I could jam that over and over again, especially like in the car driving on the steering wheel, just enjoying the drums. So good. Okay, the next song, man, she's, she's covering a lot of the issues that were going on in her life, because the next song is called Innocent. And if I remember correctly, this was, this was Kanye's one chance to be forgiven. And, you know, you had one job, Kanye, and you couldn't fucking do it. Next song is called Innocent. Lost your balance on a tightrope. I actually think it's very cool of her to have made this. Without going too far into my personal feelings, I was a huge fan of Kanye West. Um, 808s and Heartbreaks, in my opinion, is one of the greatest albums that were ever written. It, he's just, he, just an amazing artist. However, like many people, he is plagued with a lot of mental health issues. And around this time, wasn't too long after he had lost his mother, and he was spiraling. That is no excuse. None of those things are excuses for what he did to Taylor. He took away a moment that she can't get back. You don't get back your first award. You don't get to do that again. No, she's been able to go on and do amazing things with her career, but that moment in particular was very rough, obviously. And I just love that in this song, she's able to forgive him, and the things that she says makes it seem like not only is she writing this to forgive him, but also to continue to express like, hey, I'm still a fan of yours. Like, I still see so much potential and bright lights in you. She says your string of light still glows to me or whatever. I think even she could notice that in that moment, he screwed up. And I think she could notice that he noticed that he screwed up because that's one thing that I think still reigns true. He did that, he made this moment, and I think that he immediately went like, man, I shouldn't have done that. I mean, obviously Beyonce felt the same way. You never want that situation. That's not a good situation. And he spiraled. And for her to write this song so beautifully, she did not make negativity out of it. She made it a moment to just close this chapter. Hey, people are still talking about it and that's not what I want my career to be. If you're Taylor Swift, you don't want to be known as, oh, it's Taylor Swift, the girl who Kanye interrupted. You wanna know that it's Taylor Swift the girl who writes these amazing songs, the girl with these amazing music videos, you know, I don't mean to interrupt you, but Taylor Swift had one of the best videos of all time. You don't want to be known as that person. You want to be able to have your music speak for you. And this moment sort of set this definition and narrative of who she was because she was associated with this all the time and vice versa. I felt bad for Kanye because one year later, two years later, he's being interviewed and people are still asking him about it. So. As a human, you're like, damn, man, like how many times do you get to relive this? And like Taylor mentioned, you relive it every night and every night. Now, after she makes a song like this, after this moment is over, it's finished. She even wrote a song that was so beautiful and nice and putting you on a pedestal because that's where you want to be. All the things that he has done since then have obviously strayed me away from being a fan of his. Um, his support on politics, the things that were done to Taylor Swift, Later, I feel like me and Taylor might still have sex. I made that bitch famous. If I remember correctly, she's been out selling records for an extremely long time, did not need that. I feel like he tried to take these moments, turn them into more publicity stunts that would ultimately lead to more success for him at the expense of Taylor Swift. And after the history that they had had, um, and after all the moments that had happened, for him to take advantage of that phone conversation, and I, I know there's two sides to every story, and I'm not gonna sit here and blatantly say that everybody was innocent, but I do believe that Taylor Swift was pressured into agreeing to those things. I do 100% agree with that. And so for this to happen, for him to not care, and for him to throw all of this away, all of his history with Taylor Swift, um, her writing a song this beautiful, and all those things, that's where I don't blame her for the anger that she had on reputation. That's where I don't blame her for severing all ties with them. Um, he, in that moment with that phone call, 
like blacklisted her almost, ruined her career for what, two or three years she was in hiding because of this moment. And when I hear this song, it just, it bums me out even more to know that this is a Taylor who forgave him, put him back on a pedestal and was like, hey, it's okay. We all make mistakes, here you are. And for him to go back and do what he did, that's sort of where the line is drawn because I think that's extremely messed up to take advantage of somebody who you've already messed their career up one time. Granted, she came back like a phoenix, threw the ashes and killed it and did the same thing on the flop of a reputation tour. But all of those things together makes the situation so much worse. So now that I hear this song and I'm like, damn, like fix that bridge. You did not burn that bridge. You fixed it. You took the high road here and he, someone else still went low at you. I think that's messed up. So this song, while it's a beautiful song, um, it's too bad she can't get it removed from every album because I don't believe at this moment, after everything else, that Kanye really needs to be forgiven by Taylor Swift. I think that Taylor, and she's done it, move on. You're going to be more successful while there's turmoil and all those things happening with him. You continue to be successful and continue to rise because at the end of the day, that's all that matters. So it's too bad we can't just hit the delete button on this because you ain't getting no forgiveness. Okay, the next track we're going to listen to is a song called Haunted. Hearing Taylor do these rock style songs, again, I'm gonna liken it to a band like Paramore because I feel like musically, that's sort of what this and Better Than Revenge sounded like. Her voice over this is amazing. I wish there were more tracks like this in general, not on this album, but just in general from her because the vocal delivery in these is amazing, especially, again, this is a sad song, it's depressing. From what I understand, it sounds like she had ideas of this relationship, which kind of throws me back to a couple of the songs we heard before, especially Story of Us, where she's talking about she's in this relationship and she, in her mind, never would imagine that it was over. Don't leave me like this, I thought I had you figured out. She's talking about this relationship literally crumbling in front of her and she can't accept it because she can't understand that it's happening. She doesn't want to process the fact that it's actually over and that it's happening. We walk a fine line that I never thought would break. And then at one moment she says like, yeah, he's here to comfort me, but you know, basically it's you that I wanted. You know, I'll be here with this person, but you're the person that I wanted to be with. But you can hear the heartbreak in her voice. And that's where I really enjoyed the instrumentation here because it had more of like that rock emo sound, which is interesting to even say, I'm talking on a Taylor Swift album, that for the most part, it had a lot of country elements and themes to it. But the fact that it had that little bit of emo sound to it and her like, breaking her voice at the right moments sounded so sad and so heartbroken. She sounded like she was stressed out and having anxiety about this moment. And, and you could feel that coming through in her vocals. And I, I thought that just made for such an amazing moment on this album, putting this at my second favorite song on this album. Granted, you gotta take some of that with a grain of salt because you gotta think about the type of music that I am drawn to normally, which is really great guitars, good drums, excellent lyrics over all of those things and exactly what we got in Better Than Revenge. But I liked Haunted. I felt like I could feel that pain and anguish in her voice as she was saying, don't go, don't go, don't leave me like this. There was just something special about that. The next track is called Last Kiss. Fresh on the All right, so I feel like that song exists in the same element of All Too Well. It almost feels like Last Kiss and All Too Well could go together in order. Like you could listen to Last Kiss and then All Too Well is like a little bit further down the relationship. There's definitely some elements of that song that I feel in both of those songs. Again, I really enjoy, and I, I said it and I'll say it again, and I'm gonna preach it every time Taylor Swift is on this channel. I appreciate the writing here. I appreciate that you can put me into your situation, especially for a song like this that is 
very sad and tragic. She does this thing on this album three times now. Uh, 2.30 a.m. was mentioned twice, and then here, I still remember the look on your face, lit through the darkness at 1.58. I don't know if all of those are in the same song, but she did say lit through the darkness at 1.58, 2.30 a.m. in the morning for Back to December. So I don't know if these songs are supposed to go together, or maybe I'm just overthinking this here, but she has mentioned those times around the same time of day three times now. Uh, I like how she builds up the sadness when she says, I ran off the plane that July 9th, the beat of your heart, it jumps through your shirt, I can still feel your arms, but you could hear in her voice, she's escalating this song before it drops. Uh, I love your handshake, meeting my father, I love how you walk with your hands in your pockets, you kissed me when I was in the middle of saying something, there's not a day I don't miss those rude interruptions. So that was the first part that sort of made me like tear up a little bit because you just kind of picture like, think about little things that might annoy you or something that you're like, oh, I wish you didn't do that. But like as somebody who's been in relationships where they've ended, it's crazy how the things that you start to miss or things that you maybe didn't like or you didn't necessarily enjoy. Like maybe somebody, you know, it has like a bad way of paying a bill, like they're always late or something like that. And you look back and you're like, damn, like I wish our bill was late this week just cause it means that you'd be here. And so when she says there's not a day that I don't miss those rude interruptions, thinking like in that moment, she was probably like, oh my God, I wish you weren't doing this. But now that it's over, man, I, I really miss you <laughs> rudely interrupting me. I'll go sit on the floor wearing all your clothes. All I know is I don't know how to be something you miss. Never thought we'd have a last kiss. I never imagined we'd end up like this. And you think about those moments where you're in these relationships and you're, when you're in the right relationship or you're in a relationship that feels like forever, the trajectory is only forward and you never feel like it's going to end. You even said, I never, you know, I never counted on you changing your mind because you get dedicated to this person and you feel like everything's so good in this relationship it could never go anywhere. And so to hear it from Taylor's side, again, you know, never imagined you'd change your mind. So to hear her sing this song from her side as I didn't want this relationship to end, but it did, took me back, you know, back to December. It also gave me that feeling of the story of us as well. And it hurts. It hurts to hear Taylor so heartbroken. Again, it's where her best lyrics come out. It's really where she shines. It sucks to hear people that you care about or artists that you look up to or inspired by and read lyrics from, you want their lives to be good, you hear a song like this, it hurts you, especially if you feel emotionally invested or connected to that artist. It's just an amazing moment to sit here with an album. And I mentioned that on all my albums because there's something about spending dedicated time with a project and really enjoying it. Now I've known a decent amount of these songs on here, but it's the ones I didn't know that I've really come to enjoy. And I love that you can get that kind of stuff from Taylor. People have mentioned in the comments before that Taylor purposely chooses the songs, like certain songs to be on the radio and saves like the other content for the album because the fans are gonna love it. And I 100% agree with that, 100%. Now I could choose tracks like Haunted, Better Than Revenge, or I could take some of the radio hits, Back to December, Sparks Fly, Mine. I mean, I enjoyed a lot of these. The only track that I think so far wasn't really like a song that I could feel I would play back over and over was the actual title track, Speak Now. Because so far, 13 tracks in, I've gotten so much heart, anger, pain, everything from her, and I've loved it. So the last track we're gonna listen to is a song called Long Live. It is the final track to the standard release. Like a hero on a history book. Like a Okay, so the lyrics page that I'm using uh, spoiled this for me because I, I typically like to interpret what I think a song meaning is. Um, that's one of my favorite things about doing this. And, you know, reading through the lyrics as we were going through the song, there's a quote at the end of it that says that Taylor wrote this as a love song to her team, like everyone around her that helps her because Taylor Swift is not just Taylor Swift, she's a band, she's a publicist, marketers, team management, everything. There's so much that goes on that a lot of people don't see. And so there's no interpretation here, but I will say that what a cool song to have because she mentions a couple things in the song. Long live the walls we crashed through, how the kingdom light shine just for me and you. 
I was screaming, long live all the magic we made, and bring on all the pretenders, one day we will be remembered. You traded your baseball cap for a crown, and they gave us our trophies, we held them up for our town. The cynics are outraged, screaming, this is absurd, because for a moment, a band of thieves in ripped up jeans got to rule the world. I think that's a really cool moment for Taylor to give back because again, she can't do any of this by herself. And from what I understand, while there's been maybe a couple changes, I understand that she's kept a lot of the same people around for the majority of her career. And so those people are there when you're starting out and to be close to you know this success or where you're at now, that's such a big thing. And it's so important to find people that are loyal and willing to go through the rough with you. You know, Taylor's been through a lot, and even right here, 2010, so she had these breakup, controversy, some drama, uh, Kanye West thing, there's a lot going on, and her team stuck by her. So for her to, you know, long live and put this song on the album, I think is a really cool moment. And I feel like it sort of just shows the kind of person Taylor Swift is. I haven't seen much of Taylor Swift outside of her live performances and these albums, so I don't really know who she is as a person, but the thing is, when you spend time with an album and the lyrics, you can really start to um, pick up on who a person is or the type of person that artist is. And Taylor's a lover at the end of the day, no pun intended, because she, she feels a lot of heartbreak. She feels a lot. She's very emotional in some of these songs. And it makes me see that she has a huge heart with a ton of love. And it would explain why in her past relationships, she always gave so much love, even if it was quick or the media said it was quick because she just falls in love because she's a lover. And like in Enchanted, she pictures these moments as these magical fairy tales in her head of love. And it's the reason why the, uh, the story of us and Haunted are so sad. And then leading up to Last Kiss because she creates these moments in her head of what she wants it to be. And she could never imagine them being over and yet they are and she can't understand that. And I feel like I learned all of that from this album. It creates a chance for me to write my own narrative on who I think Taylor is before watching an interview, before really seeing much other than these live shows and albums. It gives me a moment to just create my own definition of what or who I think she is as a person. And Long Live just sums up the rest of the album by saying like, I'm a lover. Like, I love you guys for sticking by me. Thank you for being loyal when other people weren't. When everyone told me that I was bad or wrong, or like in the song Mean, everyone said I couldn't sing. The fact that you guys stuck by me, look where we're at now. So here's how I feel about the album. I feel like part of me went into this with this some sort of comparison in my head because I saw so many arguments about it online between Speak Now and Red. And I think, my opinion, the two don't really go together in a way to compare them. I feel like Red had a lot of heartbreak that was left open for interpretation. It was not nearly as specific as this album. I feel like it was a more mature heartbreak album. There was a lot on there that you could plug that into your life and relate to it. You could go to it during your breakup when you're sad. You can go and there's so many moments on that album that exist for what that is. So I think comparing them is out of the question. Speak Now is Taylor's truth 100%. It's literally an album written from her heart. All of her pain, her anger, her drama, her feelings towards, and, and mean, when, in my personal opinion, her feelings towards the media, the song Long Live about her team. This is Taylor speaking from her heart, speaking her truth. Whereas Red was for us to plug that into our truth. Even though she had meaning behind it, it was for us. There was more interpretation left open there. Speak Now, it was like, hey, I'm gonna speak now or forever hold my peace, like I say in the song Speak Now. I'm gonna speak now or forever hold my peace. I'm gonna tell you about how I feel about drama, how I feel about heartbreak. John Mayer, Katy Perry, Kanye West. There was just a lot of truth there. So I don't think the two can be compared. They exist in different lanes in her discography. And I think when you look at it that way, it's easier to not sit here and try to judge the two. Now. I enjoyed the instrumentation on this album a lot. There was a lot more country to it. Red, I enjoyed that there was more of that like heavier country sound to it. There was a little bit of rock to it and a little bit of pop as well. But Speak Now, she really kept those roots. I also enjoyed the two tracks that had a rock emo paramore type sound. I think it was a cool experimentation for her to do. And I hope to hear more of that at some point in her discography. Remember we have more albums that she's done before this and Lover coming out. And I just wanna hear a little bit of that sound. I know it's not as popular anymore, but she did such a good job with it. And all in all, this again just 
brought me further and further into the Taylor Swift library of amazing lyricism over wonderful instrumentation with a beautiful voice that is very unique. No one can take that from her. Sometimes pop artists or country artists, whatever, tend to sound the same, start to blend together. Taylor's voice always stands out as being unique. You know when it's Taylor Swift, you know when it's her song. It sounds like it every single time. And that itself is an art to have a signature sound on your voice that even if you go from country music to you know reputation album style songs, everyone knows it's you every single time. This album just makes me more excited to check out the rest of them all leading up to August 23rd, which is when Lover comes out. Now I do have a lot of work to do because there are more albums left and I'm moving across the country. So you will see more of her albums popping up very, very soon. I hope you guys liked this video. I hope you liked this album. Let me know in the comment section your favorite song off of this album and why. And just to challenge you, tell me your least favorite song on this album as well. I think it's important if we can talk about those things. Sometimes we can't like everything. So what was your least favorite song as well? But I hope you guys liked this video. If you did, please make sure to like the video. It really does help out. If you guys can get this thing to like 5,000 likes, I will love you forever. Tell YouTube to recommend my stuff. Also, don't forget to smash the subscribe button. We're on the road to 200,000 subscribers. I cannot do it without you. Don't forget, I will also be checking out the deluxe version tracks on my Patreon at some point this month. So if you're interested in seeing my take on those as well, I'm gonna be uploading those uncut and unedited. That's going to be one of the links in the description. Make sure to sign up for the Patreon. It supports the channel so much and I am so thankful for my Patreon members for allowing me to continue to make cool videos for you guys and to just take the stress off of paying the bills sometimes because these videos do take hours and hours and oftentimes they get demonetized, which I understand the music is not mine. When I include it, that is copyright infringement. It's just the way it is. So I'm really appreciative to have people that are supporting me. Also, don't forget to follow me on all of my social medias. I usually have them up here, but you can also check the links in the description for links to all my other things. Thank you guys so much for all of your love and support. I will see you in the next one. Peace.